Well, hello there. Welcome back to our Teletronic Radio Wave broadcast here on the Frequency Channel, fellows. Today's program, we're going to be taking a gander at some bizarre fringe culture, steampunk. What is this phenomenon? Where did it come from? Well, cinch up your corsets, grab a cane and top hat, and buckle on your welder's goggles, because today's thought experiment asks the question, what would the world be like if steampunk actually happened? I first discovered steampunk back in 2006, and it had left a lasting impression. The fusion of science and magic, past and future, fascinated me. So much so that the Clockwork Dragon is, in fact, the logo of this very channel. But what exactly is steampunk? Steampunk is a genre of science fiction which arose initially during the 60s and 70s with works like Titus Alone, The Warlord of the Air, and Morlock Knight. The term steampunk came about in 1987 when K.W. Jeter, one of the seminal writers of the movement, said, Personally, I think Victorian fantasies are going to be the next big thing, so long as we can come up with a fitting term for Powers, Blaylock, and myself something based on the appropriate technology of the era, like steampunk, perhaps. Like all punk cultures, steampunk is a counterculture. It rebels against the modern, super sleek, but technologically impersonal culture of today. Punks represent a rebellion against patriarchy, tradition, cultural limitations, and conventional norms, and steampunks are no different. Rather, steampunk is an embrace of the individual, Hallmarks of steampunk are repurposing and manipulating pre-existing items to make something unique. Oh, certainly there are trends and cliches. Goggles, for example, are a well-recognized part of the steampunk aesthetic, but each person crafts their own steam sona and brings them to life. This is a major difference between steampunk and cosplay. Generally, with cosplay, you are dressing as a specific character from a franchise or a recognized group. But with steampunk, the focus is entirely on the individual, and no two steampunks are the same. This artistic individualism was cemented when steampunk first met Burning Man in 2006. In a very real sense, steampunk is like the kit bashing of real life, taking and modifying pre-existing materials to make something wholly new and unique. In order to understand steampunk, we must cast our minds back to the 19th century and the Industrial Revolution. At the beginning of the 1800s, life in both Europe and America was very similar to how it was for most of history. Most people lived in rural areas and farmed the land. Products were largely made by hand by artisans, and information traveled very slowly. All that started to change, though, when James Watts created a new form of steam-powered engine in 1782. This machine provided power to do far more work than ever before, and soon there was a technological boom in automation. Now, thanks to growths in technology, skilled craftsmen were being rapidly replaced with factory manufacturing. These factories created new jobs in cities, and the population followed them. Wherever a factory powered by steam machines sprung up, a population center of workers would develop. Europe experienced a tremendous population boom as a result, tripling its population in less than a handful of years. The growth of this factory manufacturing saw a big growth in wealth and prosperity, but not for everyone. The actual reality of the Industrial Revolution was that it opened the door to some of the most horrific living conditions imaginable. Rather than pay expensive craftsmen, factories hired women and children who they barely needed to pay. In America, slavery was equally important for the same reason. Workers would work themselves to death, sometimes very literally, and be paid a pittance, if at all. It is not an exaggeration to say that Victorian society was built on the backs of women, children, and slaves. The advent of the steam engine also led to innovation of much faster means of travel, such as trains, steamships, and even airships like dirigibles and blimps. Faster travel meant that new ideas could spread much faster than before. Goods could be moved much quicker from one place to another, and the whole world was stitched together by trade for the first time. Unfortunately, this globalization also opened the door to colonialism and imperialism, especially in Great Britain, who ruled an expansive empire at this time. The Victorian age quickly distinguished itself as a time of tremendous change due largely to the pressures of the Industrial Revolution. Victorian men, with their misogyny, 
believed that women belonged in the home and should not be working. Moreover, they saw themselves as protectors of the weak, shining knights who could liberate women and children from the horrors of working in factories. The problem was that this notion was in direct contrast with the stark reality of the Industrial Revolution. The Church, that stalwart foundation of European society, didn't have any answers on how the situation could be resolved either. Jesus had said, mighty are the weak, but how could that be true if they were living in such terrible conditions? As a result, people's faith was challenged, and, searching for answers, they turned to the natural philosophies, or science as we call it today. During the Victorian era, science and technology boomed, due partially to Queen Victoria herself, who publicly promoted and sponsored new technology and innovations, and partially to the decline in religion. New ideas from foreign places in the Far East introduced mysticism into Victorian Europe, and a new zeal for history accelerated the humanities. Seeking something to fill the gap religion left behind, the Victorians turned their mind to ancient civilizations and cultures, and it was at this point that Egyptology grew to such popularity, and many new neo-pagan religions moved into the foreground. Such was the Victorian era, a time of great growth, but a time of great hardship also. And that is our setting for this steampunk drama to play out. In our alternate history, the pressures of the Victorian age proved to be too much, and the lower middle classes rebelled. Breaking free of the patriarchy, women claimed their place as men's equals. The women's suffrage movement that occurred in our timeline also happens here, but far quicker than it would normally do. Women, joining unions and work clubs, strike en masse against the misogynistic male oppressors and require fair and equal wages for everyone. The abolition of slavery, already imminent during that time period, also happens faster than in our timeline. If you are going to work to the bone, you better be getting paid for it. Similar to the craftsman revolution in our timeline, value of individual made products rises again against the mass production of the Industrial Revolution. But instead of being an underground movement, it becomes mainstream. As the 19th century draws to a close, we enter into an era of science, reason, and individuality. It is hard to imagine how this shift would affect the past. If, as Jules Verne conjectured, humans really did go from the Earth to the Moon before 1900, it would be extremely hard to predict where we would be technologically now. And it's not as far-fetched as it sounds. Charles Babbage, an inventor and tinker, invented a mechanical computer in 1846, though the actual decision engine was not built until long after his death. A Turing machine computer can also be made with nothing as complicated as wooden gears and clockwork. And if you can make a computer, there really is no upper limit to what can be made. If we imagine a steampunk alternate history, we would see very much the same sorts of advancements we see in our own timeline, just accelerated. For example, airships feature prominently in steampunk literature. And in this alternate history, the airship might well feature prominently in real life. The failure of the airship was that they were filled with hydrogen gas, fill a giant structure with hydrogen, an extremely flammable gas, cover it with cloth and painted with thermite, and things tend to go wrong. However, the use of aircraft in war is a powerful advantage during the American Civil War, and less than 50 years later, Zeppelins terrorized the battlefield of World War I by dropping bombs and silently spying on positions. Air superiority completely changed the face of warfare and was largely responsible for the rise of airplanes. But the airship failed primarily because of bad timing, bad luck, and bad planning. It could easily have happened differently. In fact, if the Hindenburg disaster hadn't happened, it's quite probable that airship cruising would have become a major industry. Our hypothetical steampunk world would accelerate events that would have happened in our timeline. It is unclear whether the First World War would still come to pass, but if it did, the face of war would be entirely different. Steampunk vehicles like walkers and mechs would be a tremendous asset on the battlefield, and steampunk computers would alter the First World War to be far more tactical and much more akin to the Second World War. 
and any advancements that might be made during the First World War would add fuel to the fire of the Second World War. Given the steampunk outlook on trying new things and innovation, atomic power might be achieved much faster than in our timeline. Jules Verne first imagined nuclear power in 20,000 leagues under the sea. So it's not to be wondered at that if in the steampunk alternate history they harnessed nuclear power, they would move swiftly from steampunk to atompunk. Somewhat ironically, many nuclear reactors today actually operate on steam power, where the reactor itself creates the heat necessary to boil water, create steam to turn the turbines and produce energy. So in a way, we are still in a steam era. The biggest change to the alternate present day would be how people treat learning and behavior. In our timeline, the Industrial Revolution was directly responsible for the formation of unions, women's suffrage, abolition of slavery, and the establishment of child labor laws. However, it also sponsored the current educational standard to train yourselves to fit in, to follow prescribed path and be part of the capitalism machine. This is largely because of the Victorian need for workers. Discouraging creativity and individualism was a sure way to make sure that you would always have workers for your factories and manufacturing jobs. Workers who were taught to be just like everyone else, to be a part of the machine. In a steampunk alternate history, with a focus on both mechanation and individuality, we would see a present day that is far more technologically advanced than we currently have. We will never know just how far we might have gone if the Victorian work ethics and classism hadn't held us back as a society, but that doesn't mean we can't provide that environment now. Let's train ourselves to be individuals, to stand out from the crowd and to do our own thing, the way a proper steampunk would and we can keep our eyes and mind open and always be creative thanks for watching